When the Sufis and the grave worshippers and all those decided to reject the da'wah of the Shaykh, then obviously they had to find reasons now on which they can reject the da'wah. They need evidence. And sure enough, in one of the saddest, most pathetic attempts in human history, they looked through two narrations from the Prophet ﷺ, which they used them to claim that you really have to be careful of this guy Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab. You have to be careful of him. This is where the horde of Satan came from. Now let me quote to you the two narrations so you will know exactly what we are dealing with. The first narration is the narration which was narrated to us by Bukhari. Let me give you the actual wording exactly. Bukhari. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, O oh Allah, bestow your blessings on our Sham. Sham is the area that is now called Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, Palestine. That, was, that used to be called Bilad al-Sham. O oh Allah, bestow your blessings on our Yemen. Everybody knows Yemen. The people said, O oh Messenger of Allah, and our Najd. Our Najd. And we will see what that means later on. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi said, there, meaning in Najd, will occur earthquakes, trials, and tribulations. And from there appears the horn of Satan. So he warned from where? He warned against Najd. He was making dua for Sham and Yemen. They said, include Najd. He said, no. There's going to be problems over there. Right. So they say, okay, Najd is a problem. FYI, Sheikh Muhammad Wahab was from where? From Uyayna, from Najd. Okay, so now this is their first, first point. Aha, aha, that's where the guy is coming from. Then, uh, they continue. Then the other narration which they use is a very interesting narration. It's a Sahih Bukhari as well. Hadith of Abi Sa'id al-Khudri. See, see, the Prophet Wasallam was distributing some war booty after one of the battles. And while he was in the process of distributing the war booty, a man named Dhul Khuwaisira from Bani Tamim, Pay attention now, from Bani Tamim, he said, Ya Muhammad, I'dil. O Muhammad, be just. Very dangerous statement to say to the Prophet Muhammad He, alayhi salam, said, a great pity that you have doubts. If I am unjust, then who will be just? You are a loser and a failure. He said to this man, Dhul Khuwaisira from where? From which tribe? Bani Tamim. Now you know who, who was there not to like this kind of situation? Umar. He was infuriated with this statement. He said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, allow me to strike his neck. The Prophet ﷺ said, No. There's no purpose in killing him. For he is not alone. There's actually a bunch of them. A bunch of them that will come. If you were to compare your prayers and you're fasting to theirs, you will feel ashamed of yourself. If you were to compare to the Sahaba, he's saying, your salah and your siyam to these, these people that will come, you will feel ashamed of yourself. Like, oh, I'm nothing. My salah, my siyam is nothing like these. Then he, alayhi salatu said, these are the people who will recite the Quran, but it will not go beyond their throats. It doesn't go to the heart. Sounds nice, tajweed. Idgham, uh, Idhar, Ghunna, Bidun, Ghunna, the whole nine yards. A good, nice recitation, but it doesn't go beyond the throat. Then he Ali Sosam said, with all these apparent virtues, they will leave the deen like the arrow leaves the bow. They will leave Islam. So the Sufi said, look, listen, man. First, the fitna will come from Najd. Second, from Bani Tamim. And the only person, according to them, who fits the criteria is Sheikh Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab. Because he was from Bani Tamim, from Najd. They said, khalas. Now we have an evidence that this is the man of fitna, this is a man of tribulation. We say we're kuffar. According to them, he didn't make such statements. He was speaking about the acts of the people. And anyways, they made many false accusations against them. They said that he must be the one who the Prophet ﷺ prophesied about. And we have to be careful of him. And on these grounds, they justified their insistence on disbelieving in worshipping Allah alone and worshipping dead people, braves, awliya, and as we will see later on in the lecture. But you know what? That's not exactly sound or correct. 
There's a refutation. Let me give you the refutation. First, the places which were called Najd at that time were 13 places. And the most common one was Iraq. There were 13 places. Najd, by the way, is an elevated piece of land. It's an elevated land, like a, almost like a hill. If you want to say something that is above the average ground level. This was linguistically what Najd meant. There were 13 areas called Najd back then, the most common of which was what? Iraq. That's the first thing you keep in mind. And you'll see how this is strengthened. Second, the Prophet ﷺ spoke about the fitna coming from the east. And that was the direction of Iraq, according to Ibn Hajar and many of the ulama. Thirdly, in another hadith, in another hadith, uh, let me give you the actual reference of the hadith, because it's a very important hadith. It's in Sahih Muslim. It's in Sahih Muslim, uh, the hadith of Ibn Fudayl who reported from his father, from Ibn Umar, that he heard the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say, that he heard Ibn Umar say, Afwan, the Messenger of Allah, while he was pointing to his hand towards the east, he said, verily the turmoil would come from this side, from where appears the horn of Satan, and you would strike the necks of one another, pointing at the east. Now, this is further strengthened with the hadith where Iraq is mentioned explicitly. Iraq is mentioned explicitly. Ibn Umar said to the people of Iraq, How strange is your affair? How strange is your affair? You ask about the minor sins while you commit the major sins. He is referring to them killing Al Hussein. And verily, I heard. I heard the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam point towards Iraq and mention from there will come the horn of Satan. From there the fitna will appear. A. So this is the second, third point which strengthens, strengthens our position. Abdullah said, O oh people of Iraq, how strange is your affair. This is the point that I missed. O oh people of Iraq, how strange is your affair. You ask about the minor sins while you commit the major sins and verily I heard the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to point towards where you're from and say that from here will come the horn of Satan and you will strike the necks of one another. So who was he addressing? The people of Iraq. And this hadith is where? In Sahih Muslim. Explaining what is intended by that. Secondly, there are around three to four other narrations which are authentic with the same exact Mention of Iraq explicitly. One of them in the, uh, narrated by Abu Naim in his in Hal Hilya, the hadith of Ibn Umar. I will not mention the wording. It has also Medina. Oh Allah bless our Medina, bless our Sa. You know the measuring uh, at the time of the Prophet Sallam, the, the equipment with which they used to measure, which is equal to around three liters. You will need this for Zakat al Fitr Ramadan, inshaAllah ta'ala. Then a man said, An Iraq. In the hadith, the man said, An Iraq, specifically. The Prophet ﷺ turned away from him and he said, from there will appear the horn of Satan and he will strike the necks of one another. And from, you know, you can tell Iraq has been a place of fitna ever since. And this is where a lot of the fitna happened. After the time of the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ, a lot of the issues that happened between the very various Muslims, a lot of the fighting, the bloodshed, the killing, happened all where? In Iraq. Which was what the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ was referring to. We continue. The ulama which mentioned that Iraq was intended specifically in the hadith were like Al-Karmani, Al-Khattabi, Al-Aini, Al-Nawawi, Ibn Hajar and many others. All of them agree that it has to do with what? Iraq. Not Najd. The one that they are referring, Shaykh Islam Muhammad Ibn Abdul Wahab to. Not that Najd. Because we said there are 13. Now the other narrations explain the previous ones. The other narrations explain, and this is a principle in Islam. You have to understand the texts in the light of other texts. You can't just read one text and ignore all the rest. Otherwise, you will have a misunderstanding of Islam. So this is something that we all agree to. So why do they reject the other narrations? Why do they not make mention of the narrations that specifically and explicitly mentions Iraq? Because if they do, their whole foundation will be destroyed from, from within and then they can no longer scare the people from Wahhabis so they don't mention these narrations and if they are mentioned, they will come up with lies and fabrications to reject them. It doesn't end. 
There's a hadith in a Tabarani in Awsat for Ibn Umar and a Tabarani in Kabir for Ibn Abbas. All of them mentioning what? Iraq. Specifically. Furthermore, the next for the people of Medina and the direction of East was Iraq as explained by Ibn Hazar al-Asqalani, the one who did the Sharh of Sahih Bukhari. Rahimahumullah ta'ala. Sixthly, the virtues of Bani Tamim. Now the man who was was from Bani Tamim. Does that make the whole tribe no good? If you have a good family and one of them turns out to be a thief, can you say this family is no good? No. They maintain their status in the community. Yes, this will be a disadvantage because of this person, but that does not undermine the whole family because of one individual. Now, Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu wa arda. He said that, uh, yes, I have loved Bani Tamim ever since I heard the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa say three things about them. I have loved them ever since I heard the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say three things about them. Number one, he said, these are the people that will, that will stand the most firm against the Dajjal. When the Dajjal will come, Bani Tamim will be those who will strong the firmest against them. Now, what, did, what is required for you to go against the Dajjal? What do you have to have that is strong? Your Tawheed, your Aqeedah has to be sound to deal with them. Otherwise, those who are, you know, not really on their Iman, they will believe him and follow him. You must be a strong believer, Bani Tamim. Secondly, so at some point, some people brought the Sadaqah which were brought from Bani Tamim. And the Prophet ﷺ said, these are the Sadaqat of our folk, our people. Meaning he referred them to himself alayhi salatu salam. Thirdly, Aisha used to own a slave girl that was from Bani Tamim. The Prophet ﷺ said to her, emancipate her, verily she is from the descendant of Ismail. Emancipate her, let her free. She is from the descendants of Ismail alayhi salatu salam. Because of these three instances, Abu Huraira loved Bani Tamim. So Bani Tamim, are actually people of virtue, not what they claim. So these are the ways with which we refute their statements. طيب. Now that does with the idea of Sheikh Muhammad ibn al-Wahhab and whether he is a good man or not. Uh, and we already explained that they don't like what we're saying, but we still have to mention the information for them. And Allah is the one who guides.